project, better known by its informal name, Jonestown, was a remote settlement established by the People's Temple, a San Francisco-based cult under the leadership of Jim Jones in Guana. The settlement became internationally known when, on November 18, 1978, a total of 918 people died at the settlement, at the nearby airstrip in Port Katuma, and at a temple-run building in Georgetown. Guana's capital city. The name of the settlement became synonymous with the incidents at those locations. In total, 909 individuals died in Jonestown, all but two from apparent cyanide poisoning in an event termed revolutionary suicide by Jones and some People's Temple members on an audio tape of the event and in prior recorded discussions. The poisoning in Jonestown followed the murder of five others by Temple members at Port Kaituma, including United States Congressman Leo Ryan, an act that Jones ordered. Four other Temple members committed murder-suicide in Georgetown at Jones's command, Terms used to describe the deaths in Jonestown and Georgetown evolved over time. Many contemporary media accounts after the events called the deaths a math suicide. In contrast, most sources today refer to the deaths with such terms as mass murder-suicide, a massacre, or simply mass murder. Seventy or more individuals at Jonestown were injected with poison, and a third of the victims were minors. Guards armed with guns and crossbows had been ordered to shoot those who fled the Jonestown Pavilion as Jones lobbied for suicide. Jonestown resulted in the largest single loss of American civil life in a deliberate act until September 11, 2001. People's Temple was formed in Indianapolis, Indiana, in 1955. Though its roots and teaching shared more with biblical church and Christian revival movements than with Marxism, it purported to practice what it called apostolistic socialism. In doing so, the temple preached that those who remained drugged with the opiate of religion had to be brought to enlightenment, socialism. In the early 1960s, Jones visited Guana, then a British colony, while on his way to establishing a short lord temple. While on his way to establishing a short-lived temple mission in Brazil, after Jones considered criticism in Indiana for his integrationist views, the temple moved to Redwood Valley, California in 1965. In the early 1970s, the temple opened other branches in Los Angeles and San Francisco, and would eventually move its headquarters to San Fran. With the move to San Francisco came increasingly political involvement by the temple and the high levels of approval that they received from local government. After the group's participation proved instrumental in the mayoral election victory of George Moscone in 1975, Moscone appointed Jones as the chairman of the San Francisco Housing Authority Commission. Unlike many other figures who were considered cult leaders, Jones enjoyed public support and contact with some of the highest level politicians in the United States. The candidate Walter Mondale and First Lady Rosalind Carter guests at a large 1976 testimonial dinner for Jones included California Governor Jerry Brown, Lieutenant Governor Mervyn Damali, and California Assemblyman Willie Brown, 
amongst others. Migration As 500 members began the construction of Jonestown, the temple encouraged more to relocate to the settlement. Jones saw Jonestown as both a socialist paradise and a sanctuary from media scrutiny. In 1976, Guana finally approved the lease it had negotiated with the temple for the over 3,000 acres of land in northwest Guana on which Jonestown was located. In 1974, the temple permission to import certain items duty-free. Later payoffs helped safeguard shipments of firearms and drugs through Guiani's customs. Jones reached an agreement to guarantee that Guiana would permit Temple of Members mask migration. Let's say it again. Jones reached an agreement to guarantee that Guiana would permit Temple Members mass migration. To do so, he stated that they were skilled and progressive. Obtained five hundred thousand dollars and stated that he would invest most of the group's assets in Guana. The relatively large number of immigrants to Guana overwhelmed the government's small but stringent immigration infrastructure in a country where immigrants had outweighed locals. Guanese immigration procedures were comprised to inhibit the departure of temple defectors and curtail the visas of temple opponents. Jonestown was held up as a benevolent communist community, with Jones stating, I believe we're the purest communists there are. Jones' wife, Marceline, described Jonestown as dedicated to live for socialism, total economic and racial social quality. We are here living communally. Jones wanted to construct a model community and claimed that Burnham couldn't rave about us, the wonderful things we do, the project, the model of socialism. To leave Jonestown without his express prior permission, to stress their loyalty to Burnham's People National Congress Party. One Temple member, Paula Adams, was involved in a romantic relationship with Guana's ambassador to the U.S., Lawrence Bonnie Mann. Jones bragged about other female Temple members he referred to as public relations women, giving all for the cause in Jonestown. Viola Burnham, the wife of the Prime Minister, was also a strong advocate of the temple. Later, Burnham stated that Guana allowed the temple to operate in the manner it did on the references of Moscone, Mondal, and Rosalind Carter. Burnham also said that when Deputy Minister Palmy Reed traveled to Washington, D.C., in September of 1977 to sign the Panama Canal Treaties, Mondale asked him, How's Jim? which indicated to Reed that Mondale had a personal interest in Jones' well-being. Life inside Jonestown, after its migration, was not very enjoyable. Although Jonestown contained no dedicated prison and no form of capital punishment, Various forms of punishment were used against members considered to have serious disciplinary problems. Methods include imprisonment in a plywood box and forcing children to spend a night at the bottom of a well, sometimes upside down. This torture hole, along with beatings, became the subject of rumor along local Guinese, upon local Guinese. For some members who attempted to escape, drugs such as Thorazine, Sodium Pentothal, Coral Hydrate, Demerol, and Valium were administered in an extended care unit. 
Armed guards patrolled the area day and night to enforce Jonestown's rules. Children were generally surrendered to communal care, and at times were only allowed to see their biological parents briefly at night. Jones was called father or dad by both adults and children. The community had a nursery at which 33 infants were born. For a year, it appears that the commune was run primarily through social security checks received by members. Up to $65,000 in monthly welfare payments from the U.S. government agencies, two Jonestown residents were signed over to the temple. In 1978, officials from the U.S. Embassy in Georgetown interviewed Social Security recipients on multiple occasions to make sure they were not being held against their will. None of the 75 people interviewed by the embassy stated that they were being held captive, were forced to sign over welfare checks, or wanted to leave Jonestown. Demographics of Jonestown Jonestown was made up of primarily African American people. They were essentially 70% of the population, 45% of which were women. There were 460 black females, 231 black males, 138 white females, and 108 white males. There were 27 mixed females, 12 mixed males, 13 other female, and 10 other men. Events in Jonestown before Ryan's visit. The White Knight Rehearsals. Jones made frequent addresses to temple members regarding Jonestown's safety, including statements that the CIA and other intelligence agencies were conspiring. with capitalist pigs to destroy the settlement and harm its inhabitants. After work, when purported emergencies arose, the temple sometimes conducted what Jones referred to as white nights. During such events, Jones would sometimes give the members of Jonestown four options. Attempt to flee to the Soviet Union, commit revolutionary suicide, stay in Jonestown and fight the purported attackers, or flee into the jungle. On at least two occasions during White Nights, after a revolutionary suicide vote was reached, a simulated mass suicide was rehearsed. Temple defector Deborah Layton described the event in an affidavit. Everyone, including the children, were told to line up. As we passed through the line, we were given a small glass of red liquid to drink. We were told that the liquid contained poison and that we would die within 45 minutes. We all did as we were told. When the time came when we should drop dead, Reverend Jones explained that the poison was not real and that we had just been through a loyalty test. He warned us that the time was not far off when it would become necessary for us to die by our own hands. The temple had received monthly half-pound shipments of cyanide since 1976, after Jones obtained a jeweler's license to buy the chemical, reportedly to clean gold. In May of 1978, a temple doctor wrote a memo to Jones asking permission to test cyanide on Jonestown's pigs, as their metabolism was close to that of human beings. Jones's Declining Physical and Mental Health Jones' health significantly declined while in Jonestown. In 1978, Jones was informed of a possible lung infection, upon which he announced to his followers that he had, in fact, lung cancer. A ploy to foster sympathy and strengthen support within the community. Jones was said to be abusing injectable Valium, 
quaaludes, stimulants, and barbiturates. Audio tapes of 1978 meetings within Jonestown attest to Jones' physical declining condition. With the commune leader complaining of high blood pressure, small strokes, weight loss of 21 to 30 pounds in the last two weeks of Jonestown, temporary blindness, convulsions, and in early November 1978, while he was ill in his cabin, grotesque swelling of the extremities. Jones often mentioned chronic insomnia. He would often say he went for three or four days with no rest. During meetings and public addresses, his once sharp speaking voice often sounded slurred. Words ran together or were tripped over. Jones would occasionally not finish sentences even when reading typed reports over the commune's PA system. Ritterman was surprised by the severe deterioration of Jones's health when he saw him in Jonestown of November 17, 1978. After covering Jones for 18 months for the examiner, Ritterman thought it was shocking to see his glazed eyes and festering paranormal, bleh, and festering paranoia face to face to realize that nearly a thousand lives, ours included, were in his hands. Investigation. Leo Ryan, who represented California's 11th Congressional District, announced that he would visit Jonestown. Ryan was friends with the father of Bob Houston, a Timbal member in California whose mutilated body was found near train tracks on October 5th, 1976, three days after a taped telephone conversation with Houston's ex-wife, in which leaving the temple was discussed. Over the following months, Ryan's interest was further aroused by the allegations put forth by Stone, Layton, and the concerned relatives. On November 14th, Ryan flew to Jonestown along with a delegation that included Jackie Spear, Ryan's then legal advisor, Neville Anaborn, representing Guana's Ministry of Information, Richard Dwyer, Deputy Chief of Mission of the U.S. Embassy to Guana, San Francisco Examiner reporter Tim Reiterman, Examiner photographer Greg Robinson, Don Harris, Bob Brown, Steve Sung, Bob Flick, Charles Cross, Ron Javers, and concerned relatives' representatives, including Tim and Grace Stone, Steve and Anthony Guitaris, Beverly Oliver, Jim Cobb, Sherwin Harris, and Caroline Houston Boyd. Of November 18th, 11 Temple members since danger enough to walk out of Jonestown and all the way to the town of Matthews Ridge, in the opposite direction from the Porkatama airstrip. Those defectors included members of the family of Jonestown's head of security, Joe Wilson. When journalists and members of the concerned relatives arrived in Jonestown later that day, Marcel and Jones gave them a tour of the settlement. The End of Jonestown Congressman Leo Ryan and the other members of his party, including several defectors from the People's Temple at Jonestown, attempted to leave Jonestown on November 18, 1978. This sadly ends in tragedy, as all members attempting to leave are gunned down by members of Jonestown, known as the Red Brigade. Known as the Red Brigade. There were no survivors, although the two pilots of the Cessna that they were attempting to take did manage to escape. Deaths in Jonestown. After the death of the congressman, Jones reportedly told everyone in Jonestown that there would now be consequences more dire than death if they were to be captured. 
He urged all of the members of Jonestown to take their own lives with poison instead of taking the alternative. Okay. According to escaped temple member Odell Rhodes, the first to take the poison was Rouletta Paul and her one-year-old son. A syringe without a needle was fitted to squirt poison into the infant's mouth, after which Paul squirted another syringe into her own mouth. Stanley Clayton also witnessed mothers with their babies first approach the tub containing the poison. Clayton said that Jones approached people to encourage them to drink the poison, and after that, after adults saw the poison begin to take effect, they then showed a reluctance to die. The poison caused death within five minutes for the children, less for babies and an estimated 20 to 30 minutes for adults. After consuming the poison, according to Rhodes, people were then escorted away down a wooden walkway leading outside of the pavilion. It is not clear if some initially thought the exercise was another white night rehearsal. Rhodes reported being in close contact with dying children. In response to reactions of seeing the poison take effect on others, Jones counseled, Die with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. He also said, I tell you, I don't care how many screams you hear. I don't care how many anguished cries. Death is a million times preferable to ten more days of this life. If you knew what was ahead of you, you'd be glad to be stepping over tonight. As more temple members died, eventually the guards themselves were called in to die by poison. Jones was found dead, lying next to his chair in the pavilion between two bodies, his head cushioned by a pillow. His death was caused by a gunshot wound to his right temple that Gowani's chief medical examiner, Leslie Mutu, stated was consistent with being self-inflicted. The events at Jonestown constituted the greatest single loss of American civil life in a deliberate act until the incidents of September 11, 2001. The only medical doctor to initially examine the scene at Jonestown was Mutu, who visually examined over 200 bodies and later told a, a Gowanese coroner's jury to have seen needle marks on at least 70. However, no determination was made as to whether those injections initiated the introduction of poison or whether they were so-called relief injections to quicken death and reduce suffering from convulsions from those who'd previously taken the poison orally. Mutu and American pathologist Lynn Crook determined that cyanide was present in some bodies, while analysis of the contents of the vat revealed several tranquilizers as well as potassium cyanide and potassium chloride. Plastic cups Flavorade packets, syringes, some with needles and some without, littered the area where the bodies were found. Mutu concluded that a gunshot wound to Annie Moore could not have been self-inflicted, though Moore had also ingested a lethal dose of cyanide. Guani's authorities waived the requirement for autopsies in the case of unnatural death, Doctors in the U.S. performed autopsies on only seven bodies, including those of Jones, Moore, Lawrence Schatt, and Carolyn Layton. Moore and Layton were selected among those autopsied in part because of the urging of the Moore family, including Rebecca Moore, the sister of two victims who was not a Temple member herself. Georgetown, the temple headquarters in America also received orders from Mr. Jones. 
Temple member Sharon Amos received a radio communication from Jonestown instructing the members of the headquarters to take revenge on the Temple's enemies and then commit revolutionary suicide. Later, after police arrived at the headquarters, Sharon escorted her children, Lyanne, Krista, and Martin, into a bathroom. Wielding a kitchen knife, she first killed Krista and then Martin. Lyanne assisted Sharon in killing herself with a knife, after which Lyanne killed herself as well. But if one thing can be taken away from this terrible event, it's that I think we need to all care for ourselves and watch out for manipulation. Because not everybody out there is looking for your best interest.